I'm Cameron Strang, and welcome to Unedited. My guest today is Hillsong United frontman, Joel Houston. United has been an instrumental part of the modern worship movement over the last 20 years. After a three-year hiatus in late April, they released their highly anticipated new album, People, which is a bit of a throwback project for the band. After a couple of more experimental uh, studio albums, People was recorded live, not only as an album, but also as a visual worship concert experience. It debuted at number two on the Billboard 200. United is currently on a nationwide arena tour, which culminates July 2nd at Madison Square Garden in New York City. I got the chance to see the tour when they came through Orlando last week, and I have to tell you, it was so good. I've seen United countless times over the years, and it's always creative and innovative and moving. It's a memorable and unexpected worship experience. But I'll tell you, there was something different this time. Something felt like it shifted spiritually. Specifically, I sensed a shift in Joel. I talked to him about that coming up. For Relevance 99th issue in May, we put Hillsong United on the cover for the third time. But this time, the story was different. It focused primarily on Joel's personal journey over the last few years. It was moving and vulnerable as he opened up about a personal crisis he went through and the painful process of rediscovering, as he put it, the wonder again. You should check it out. After the concert and a quick bite, I sat down with Joel. From time to time, you'll hear the chaos of an arena getting packed up in the background. It was an interesting time and location to talk to an artist like Joel Houston. He was drained from performing for the last two hours, but also energized by what God just did, and not to mention some pretty stellar vegan tacos we just had. Joel talks openly about what shifted for him. He talks about the journey since their last album, the reality of that quarter life or midlife crisis so many of us go through. He talks about dreaming again. Joel's somebody that I've known almost since the beginning of Relevant. From opposite sides of the world and in very different ways, we've, we've both been part of the same move that God's been doing in this generation. It, it knit us together. And it's interesting hearing him talk that we both feel the same shift happening right now. It's a different era. And God's doing something new all over again. New wine. New wineskin. We get into all of it and a lot more. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Joel Houston. So thanks for doing this. Uh, I can't imagine how exhausted you are. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel great. Yeah? yeah? So good. You've been doing this, what, 20 years? Yeah, it sounds long, like a long time when you say it like that. But 20 years sounds like a long time any which way you say it, right? It's 20 years, for it's real. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Tonight felt different. Yeah. Did it feel different to you guys? Yeah. Like, I, I, I was trying to remember the first time I saw you. I mean, it was probably 04, 05. I was wearing a Zubaz t-shirt. Yeah. You commented on it afterwards. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And I mean, and, and I've probably seen every tour multiple times mm -hmm. and tonight felt different. Mm. Why? Man, I think it's, I don't, I me some things you kind of can't, it's hard to find words for, you know, like, but I got to, you know, there's just something, um, I think it's like a whole kind of collision of different things. I think it's stuff to do with what? Um, what God's been doing in us. I think it's stuff to do with um, just where we're at as a culture. And I think um, I think these songs have come out of a place that felt timely when we wrote them. And we hadn't toured. We haven't toured for three years. It might be that. Um, it's been surprising. It's been like, you know, I came in with high expectations, but wasn't, you know, you're never really sure exactly even whether people are going to turn up. You know, it's a big deal for people to come out and, you know, um, come to a night and, 
hang around for three hours and whatnot and and um and then be engaged because there's just so much going on all the time. I feel like every time I look at Instagram, there's like 50 tours kind of floating around everywhere. And so sometimes it makes you think, you know, is there a point in us doing it? I mean, when we started with United, one of the things um, for us was it was kind of like it felt like we were always kind of trying to um, take new ground or step into something that, you know, we hadn't seen happen before, you know. And, um, and even writing songs, like I think when we first started writing songs, I mean, Delirious would just just wrecked us when we were kids but um but it just felt like there was a space where um you know we could write songs that felt genuine to us and kind of like was music that we liked and and then you know like even a few years ago i remember looking around at the space and i'm going man there's just so much great worship music out there like genuinely like amazing artists people friends churches creating great stuff and uh so i was like maybe like I, you know i don't want to just add more noise or like hot air to the mix you know it's, it's like so I, had, I think there was real questions about whether or not, like, it was, um, you know, maybe it was time to kind of look at look at other opportunities. What did you think? I felt like I put in my heart when I was a young man. And like, it was a few years ago, you're saying? Yeah, I probably like right after we did one day, you know, mm -hmm. to be talk, and we talk about it in the magazine a little mm -hmm. bit. But um, yeah, so you know, looking at, I was, I was just like, are we just gonna? I don't want to just go out and tour. It feels like there's lots of people out there, and that they're, what they're doing is fantastic. So. You know, there's a lot of other people and spaces and places and things that we could be, you know, using our energies to kind of like um, affect in one way or another. But um, the funny thing is on the other side of this is it's almost like what God kind of reawakened in, in, in me at least was just this, um, just getting back to the bare basics of it, you know, like the, the heart and soul, flesh and blood, bones of what it means to just kind of like, you know, just get together with people, community, church, um, and especially like, I keep coming back to just even our name, like United, you know, and because, you know, when we, when that was the name we put across Hillsong United as a youth ministry, like, had no idea. There was no plans to like ever record music or, you know, travel the world, any of this. Like, that wasn't in like, I had dreams in my heart, but this was, these were none of it. And, um, and it was just the name we put on it because we put the three age groups together for a night. That's what we call it, United Night, just get everyone together. It, it just seemed kind of arbitrary at the time. And then even all these years, it's kind of like, you know, it's cool. Like, you know, it actually means something, you know. It's, um, and then this, you know, kind of coming into this project, I was looking at, you know, what we're we going to call the album. What are we going to call the tour? There's all these fancy names, you know, these cool names for a tour. And I was just like, it was just, I don't know, just wrote the word people, put it next to the word United. And I thought there's something in that. And it just made me look at the name United. And I just went, man, like, um, like I felt like God knew what he was doing a long time ago. He saw like what happened tonight here in Orlando and what happened last night in Greenville and night before. He saw all of that way back when we were just kids with no idea. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying there's just a power. There's a power to it, you know. And the, you know, the, even the decision a number of years ago just not play at, at churches and to play in these kind of like, you know, these kind of um, venues that are. Um, you know, familiar that are kind of easy for people to kind of come to, and even for people like who would never maybe go to a church, you mm -hmm. know, they'll come here because they saw Tame Impala two nights ago or whatever, and and maybe step in and um, experience something they otherwise wouldn't. All of these things that there's intention to it, but there's just a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of like God just orchestrating things that when you look back at it, you go, ah, oh, all right, maybe like maybe God's really in this, you know, and. I'm not saying that like in a funny way, like I've always felt like God's in it. If he wasn't, I wouldn't be. But like um, it it genuinely feels like God's in it right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that he's worked through all these seasons where we, you know, I know we went one way or another or we tried this, tried that. And always, it's been good the whole time. But right now, something special. And I can't put my finger on it. But I said tonight, um, and I meant it, like last time we were in Orlando, the atmosphere wasn't like this. Mm -mm. And last time we were in Greenville, Carolina, I promise you where we were last night, the atmosphere was anything like what it was last night. And I feel like something's bubbling and I can't explain it. And, um, you know, like, you no, know, I live in America now. You know, I call it my home. I've been here almost 10 years and um, I care about this place. I care about the church in this place. I, I have always been driven um, by dissatisfaction, deep dis dissatisfaction, this desire for things to be better, hmm. for the church to be better. Um, and... I think a lot of um, the last few years, a lot of the passion and drive that's just come back to when I said the bare bones of what we do is just a simple desire to see the church 
be a place that's full of joy and not that happy, clappy, you know, hey, everybody, like, we're, you know, onward Christian warrior kind of thing. It's more like this actual deep, gritty, dirty joy that's, like, founded in um, a revelation of who Jesus is and what it means um, to be His hands and feet, His living flesh and blood here on earth. Now, that to me is the realest thing in the world. If we don't believe that, man, like, then, I, then we're a waste of our time, you know? Mm. So, I think all of those things combined, mm-hmm. we're in a good place. Um, it's fresh for us again. I feel like these songs have got something to say. I think the church is in an interesting place where I feel like God's sifting. He's shaking things up mm. and He's sifting. Um, and, you know, when that happens, you know, it's like all the... Um, it's just clear. I feel like he's clearing out the house, you know, a little bit. Um, and that, that can come with a certain sense of uh, doom, depending on how you look at it. Or it could look like an opportunity where God's going, hey, I hope you're ready for what's about to happen. I don't know what that is. I'm not getting all spooky or nothing. I just feel like, I feel like God, man, he just wants a church who just, um, man, really believes it, you know, and, and lives it. That to me is like the only hope we've got. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's I'm clinging to that we're writing songs you know I feel like even like this this album to me it was like trying to write a soundtrack for for something special that God's going to do and we'll see I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender chased my heart of drifting drifted home again plundered blessing till I've been desperate to you uh you went away for a few years i mean i mean you hillsong worship tours and they were all around but mm-hmm. you weren't mm-hmm. where were you what happened <laughs> i was what? chilling on my couch <laughs> <laughs> did you burn out um i think burnout was part of it I don't know, like there's all those kind of words. I mean, my dad, you know, my dad was, you know, especially back in the day, was a bit of a faith guy. I, used to, I remember he used to go, I don't believe in a midlife crisis, you know. <laughs> and um, and so I think I didn't believe in them either. And then I, you know, I turned 37 and then I turned 38. And then I thought everything was fine. And then um, and everything was like on the outside, even like just sometimes I would slap myself in the face and like, what's wrong with you? Like you got a, you know, a beautiful wife, beautiful child. And my son's just the best thing and whatever i've been afforded far more grace than i deserve opportunities that i don't couldn't imagine i mean my life anyway you look at it from the outside in well, the inside out you know i'm like man it's fantastic but yeah i just woke up one day and just was like felt like i had nothing to look forward to and um mm. and that was a really strange feeling and i you know i, I think everybody has ups and downs highs and lows and whatnot you know i've, I've had seasons that have been tough that I've struggled with, um, you know, just perspective, I guess, because I think that's what it is a lot of the time. Um, but this was different, and it, it took me by surprise. And, and I, I, I just started, um, I went through a season where just, to be honest, I just started questioning everything about uh, myself, really. Mm-hmm. Not so much God, like me, you know, like like maybe you're only here because of whose son you are. You mm-hmm. know, maybe, um, maybe you're not as, you know, um, Maybe you're doing more harm than good. Maybe you're, um, hmm. you're leading people, you know, like with the best of intention. But even like, you know, sometimes I see um, people who have the best of heart, you know, maybe get carried away with the wrong. What? No, it's not, not a big deal. But my biggest fear in life would be to like for, for someone to lead somebody astray, you know, like where they get caught up with the wrong stuff. And uh, I've learned since learned, you know, you can't control that. You know, like if you live that way, ultimately you just stop doing everything, which is why I stopped doing everything. Hmm. And um, and then just questioning <clears throat> whether or not um, my best days were behind me, whether um, whether just all that kind of stuff. It's just like classic. I mean, I know a lot of guys go through it, and even you know, since I felt you know so many friends going through a similar period um, mm-hmm. stage stage in life, and um, but it was like it, for a moment it was really dark. Lights were out, and um, I, you know, I had to make some hard decisions and and um, and come to it. And, and I'm so grateful for the people who are around me. But before that had happened, we'd already made a decision about three, four months before that to kind of um, take a year off with United. Writers were about to kind of go into promoting Wonder and touring that and all the rest of it. And um, we got on a bus. We'd done some event in Dallas. We'd been promoting the album. And 
we got on a bus and you know you're looking at the next few months and we're going to do this thing called wonder in the wild where we're going to go play in prisons and go and play at people's houses and just kind of do that kind of thing for a while the opposite of what empire's tour was and um, we did it for a couple of weeks and then we got on a bus in dallas and i just looked at everybody i felt shot you know like and looked at everybody else and i just said hey what if we just don't do it like what if we just go home and um it was like what do you mean I'm like, look, what if we don't do this? Like, what if we just take some time off? And literally everyone just kind of burst into tears. And I, I knew at that point, we're like, all right, yeah. You know, there was that whole thing with the movie. There was all these different things that kind of compounded that just, just wore on us emotionally and um, physically and time away from home, that feeling of kind of, I mean, all the promotion we had to do for that film was like, because that wasn't our idea, you know, like we kind of just kind of found ourselves in it and then there was all this pressure and, and even that film, which was, you know, it's great. It's helped a lot of people. You know, I'm not, I don't regret it, but there's a part of me that really does because it wasn't, like it wasn't, we didn't make, like it wasn't us. And so it was somebody telling a story about somebody us. Telling and it story. felt, so in some ways it felt like you, we were getting a little bit like, um, this, this is not the right adjective, but prostituted, <laughs> you know, like a little oh, bit, sure. you know, like yeah, yeah. by the industry, by that kind of side of Christian entertainment, whatnot, which has always, you know, been a bit of a wrestle for us. So, I think that hurt a little bit, um, but at the same time, God's used it. So, I mean, someone told me tonight, you know, like the craziest testimony about how they saw that film and it, you know, it changed life. So, for as yeah. conflicted as you are about it, it was mm. phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, it really was like ministry, man. Mm. But the thing is, the key word is conflicted, you know, like, so I'm, I was conflicted about it. It was more, I think, about what was going on in us than, um, than the merit of that or, or whatnot, you know, and, and I think when you are conflicted, it, it, like I said before, it's perspective. It affects your perspective. So it's not, you're not seeing things as they are. You're seeing things uh, either as you are, or as you're seeing, you know, as you're feeling. Um, and so and the enemy loves jumping on that. You know, there's a reason mm -hmm. why Jesus heals so many people of sight, you know, um, mm. because I think it's one of the first things that goes, you know, for us if, if, and the enemy loves jumping on it. So that's just one of those things. I think perspective was, has been a big deal. And I'm looking at, you know, even like tonight, you know, I've stood on stages like this one. I've stood on this stage a number of times. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm just so grateful. Like, I'm genuinely looking around at people just going like, like, what? Are, I'm just grateful to be here. Is that the difference? Because you were different tonight. Huh? Like, you were different. Like, it wasn't just like it felt different. You were different. Mm. I could see the gratitude. Like, you were like, I don't know, there was a connection mm. that you were there. Like, you're, you were present in a way I haven't seen before. Yeah. It was really special. How did you, like when you were in that lowest moment, those months after you bailed, you know, canceled the tour and stuff, how did you, like, what was the journey? Because, I mean, a lot of people have found themselves in that crisis. Hmm. How did you pull yourself out? What did well, God do? There was a few things. I mean, um, before it kind of like slapped me in the face, you know, I had a few friends coming up to me, you know, emailing me or texting me out of the blue and going, hey, man, how you doing? Is everything all right? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm great. I'm great. You know, I'm great. And I think my way of dealing with things in the past is just to get busier, you mm -hmm. know, just to be consumed. So, um, you know, I was buried in just in, in the project and different things. And um, I was writing a book um, and, you know, uh, I've never written a book before. I started writing a book, you know, it was meant to be 60,000 words. And I think at one point I looked at the word count and it was, you know, uh, well over a million words that I'd written. Come on. And so, uh, yeah, it was stupid. <laughs> it was absolutely ridiculous. I basically just went back, kept going in and just going like, just writing layers of words into the words I've written. Oh my God. And then I think it just kind of, I got lost in it. And so for me, it was like this vortex that just kind of, and there was obviously what I didn't realize was because I hadn't written that much since, I've never written that much. Who writes that much? But since high school, you know, I hadn't written more than 200 words at a time, you know, like, um, and I didn't even know how you could write like a chapter, like how you could write 4,000 words. Like, what is that? Like, who can write 4,000 words? Um, but I would just write, I was writing 10,000 words a day, just like, just going in and I didn't want to stop and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So I thought I was doing great and I'm writing stories I'd forgotten about, like streams of consciousness that just like... And um, I think because it wasn't songwriting, it was just this this thing I hadn't activated for a long time, and and um, I just was writing. I wrote, 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 and I think I wrote myself uh, a little crazy, and um, and kind of missed every deadline because I, how do you edit that? Like I didn't even know where to stop and where to start, and um, and got to a point where we got it down to one hundred twenty thousand words, and and um, 
and then um, sent that off to the publishers who were like, who are amazing to be honest, but like we're, you know, un- then kind of lining me up for this kind of crazy promotional tour and all the stuff they wanted to do. And, um, and at the same time, I think I'd, you know, I'd been home a lot with my family, but I'd been so in this book. I hadn't, you know, spent the time I needed to with my kid. And there was like a lot of like self guilt and stuff, you know, like, and then, and then you set self sabotage on them on top of that, because what you do is you, you go, Oh man, like, I've been a crappy father. Like I haven't spent enough time with my son. I've been away so much and I get home and then I'm trying to spend time with him. And then, you know, I'm like, I find an excuse. So I go into writing this book. Like when I finish the book, I'm just going to hang out with it. You know, all these kind of real things. Mm. Same with my wife. And she was amazing. And then one day she just came in. It was the day I handed the manuscript over. I thought everything's fine. And she's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm on top of the world. Everything's fine. And then, um, a week later I was in LA. Um, and I woke up the morning after Hillsong Conference and um, and I, that, all I wanted to do that day was take um, my son to Disneyland. You know, I'd been like, I'm going to take you to Disneyland when I'm finished with this. And, um, and it became clear, my, my wife, basically my wife just said to me, like, you're a mess. I'd got home late, you know, after, after that night and um, I lost it, just lost it. And then, you know, about three or four of my friends came out and said, like, is it, you know, everything, you need to not do this book. And I'm like, I don't want to do the book. It was all the pressure of it. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it felt too late. You know, it was like release date was like two months away or something crazy. And they had it all lined up. And my wife just called the publisher and said, he's not doing it. And they mm-hmm. were amazing. Like, um, I don't know if they were amazing or not because I never talked to them. But they they did it, you know, sent, sent them back their check. <laughs> um, and I said, I don't, I, I, to this day, I still haven't opened the manuscript, you know. So it's still sitting unopened in my, in my email. And I just went one day, I, it felt like I wrote that book and one day it'll be fine. Like, hmm. um, but it's not now and it's not, it wasn't then, it's not now. And then, the, you know, basically, I mean, yeah, like I just, I didn't know if I was crazy or not. And then um, basically Gary Clark, who's uh, our lead pastor, he's a Hillsong pastor in London. He's just like, he's like a second dad to me. He's just been, he's awesome. And, he basically just grabbed me and said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. And I just, um, basically I just realized in that moment that the last three months, like what I was basically writing my way, um, almost like a distraction from like, I guess this deep, deep pain I had that I just didn't, you know, like we get good when you've been a Christian for a while, you, you get good at kind of like, you know, um, turning off all the right kind of switches so that it feels like everything's fine, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think I deceived myself, you know, like, so I actually genuinely thought I was doing great. And then I stopped and looked back and I think about these moments I had in mm. that time. And I'm talking about dark moments, like, and I was just brushing them off, but that was the realest, like, so I was in a hole. I didn't, couldn't even see it myself. I lost perspective mm. altogether. And so uh, a couple of friends got me together. It was almost like an intervention and said, Hey, um, you know, hey, you know, what's going on? You know, like, and have you ever felt like this? Have you ever felt like that? And I was like, yeah, yeah, and I lost it. And then, um, so I went to England. I was meant to be flying out to Australia for our worship conference. Um, and, you know, I was meant to be speaking at it and la, 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 da, da, and I just didn't turn up. And so when it was happening, I was in Scot- in England, sorry, staying at Gary's house, like in his kids. It was, I felt like a teenager at, mum and dad's house again yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. and we just he just spent time with me and just nothing just did nothing he just just chill so i spent a week kind of in london the weather was terrible and i just kind of i had a guitar and um and then i went and saw a friend which we talk about in the magazine, the magazine yeah um, so he sent me to see this guy who's an amazing guy scotland who i've since found out a lot of people who <laughs> been in similar places to me and do it uh, you know he's helped and um, I went saw him, and he kept apologising because his house was uh, under construction. And I was like, "Well, it's no big deal. I'm just happy to be here, you know." And we got to the house, and I just saw this beautiful English manor. It was all, it was like a you know construction site. And I, I literally it was like in the moment, just was like, oh "My God, like that's that's." I'm looking at my life right there. It's okay. And I love architecture. I wanted to be an architect when I was a kid. So just I saw it, and I was like, "Man, okay, this this I could see what." the finished product was going to be. Mm-hmm. And um, 
amongst all the rubble and everything that was there. We talked. He told me I wasn't crazy. He told me I was dancing with my shadow. That made a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you, you, you're reconciling your shadow. And he goes, when you learn to dance with it, you know, you, you'll be unstoppable. You know, and most people don't even front up to their shadow but you know you live in the lights and so you know it's there and it's it's part of who you are it's you know there's like ego is not a bad thing or bad and and a shadow is not all bad either you know mm. there's a good side to your shadow and there's a there's um there's actually a good side to your ego too if you that's where you get your confidence from that's where you get your, you know your boldness but you let one of those things if you lose perspective and they go out of shape um it, you'll just be a, a conflicted mess and and that's what i was i was wrestling you know it's kind of like felt like you know the big i look at jay the story of you know, jacob and um you know the wrestle you know it was just before the sun came up and before he crossed the jabbock and you know got his new name it's like you know there's this moment there we had to wrestle and, he, and you know um i kind of feel like that's what the season was a little bit for me i don't mm. know if that sounds that doesn't sound pretentious in any way but no, like no. just it just felt like there was this moment where um I was wrestling to find something else. And, and this guy this guy said to me, he said, look, he goes, you don't have to do anything. You're not crazy. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, like, he goes, you're actually, I think you, you know, he, he encouraged me in a way. And he said, um, you know, God gave you everything you need to, to work through the season, like from when you were a little kid. He goes, like, you're not, he didn't put, you know, you're not in this place, like, empty-handed, you know, like God gave you the tools, the weapons to get out of it. Hmm. and I'm like, oh, yeah, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, like, you're going to write your way out of it. He's, he's going to give you songs. He's going to give you metaphor. He's going to give you story. He's going to give you narratives. He's going to give you words to say and melodies, and they're the things. And it was really funny because I don't think there was a specific point where, like, music became work to me ever. Like, it's always been um, – I've always felt like it's a wrestle, writing songs. Um, and I've always enjoyed it for the challenge. It's always come from that dissatisfaction, that desire for something that – you know, you, you know, you have that feeling like there's a way to articulate like a feeling or something about God that you, 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 you know, and you, it's like digging until you find it. So I've always enjoyed that side of it. But he was like, no, you, this is for you. Like, like you need to write your way out of this. And, and if I was honest, like 12 months before that, you know, writing had been a bit of a challenge. I, I got back to Gary's house in London and I went and picked up this guitar and I just started writing songs. And, um, and they uh, they just came like they just one after the other. I wrote Highlands because his, mm -hmm. his castle was his or his manor thing was in the was in the Highlands. You know, like that came out of um, there. I wrote it standing on his porch. these songs um you know like it was great because you know basically i just stayed at home for six months and then you know a few of the other guys came over and just to write and there was no pressure and um i took six months off completely from everything um and i just wrote just wrote and wrote songs not words um not not book words and um and i think having buried myself so much in writing that book um when i came back to to playing the piano it was just felt so new again um but that's i think that's like what the you know that there in itself is a metaphor for the, these kind of seasons that we go through is like yeah. you know sometimes you just gotta it's i felt like god pulled me out of something mm -hmm. that i was loving or that i thought i was loving or that i thought was going well he pulled me out yanked me out had to go through a little season um got blinded for a minute <laughs> you know um so that he could remind me again of some stuff that maybe I'd taken for granted or forgotten about that was really precious because I'd lost my inspiration, lost my desire to do, never thought I'd leave worship again, couldn't imagine, thought my best days were behind, was just like, what do I do now? I was thinking about all kinds of other crazy ideas and he reminded me of the dreams he put in my heart when I was younger. And it was real strange because I remember sitting there and thinking, there was all these things when I was in my 20s that I wanted to do with my life. And at the time, you know, I felt like what God had said to me was, hey, just be faithful with what's in your hand and I'll be faithful with what's in your heart. And that made sense to me because I, I mean, how do you achieve anything in life? Or how, you know, for me, I was such an insecure 
uh, young person, especially in my 20s, really insecure. I didn't feel like I was near good enough to sing in front of people. I didn't have a good voice. You know, I wasn't nearly as talented. What? As, no, trust me, honestly. I mean, you go back and listen to some of those early United records. <laughs> I didn't have a good voice. And believe me, I'm using all the help I can get. I got like Telelli doubling every single thing I sing, <laughs> you know, because it's like I did not have a good voice, you know, like, and, and yet, you know, like I didn't want to lead worship. I was happy to be a bass player and, you know, um, and I found myself thrust in these places and, I remember God's just like the, the the simple messages that for me like well, the simple things I've clung to is like you know if God's got you there you just got to trust that He's going to do what He needs to through you. So that was a big one because that was like a with my insecurity that was a big deal. Like I'm like I'm just going to trust that if I'm here like God's going to have to do something because I don't sure don't feel I feel out of place because in comparison. There's always going to be a better singer and a better songwriter yeah. and a better performer. But we, like, we know that, but, you yeah. know, that's still real, right? Like, it's still real for me now, you know? Yeah. But the, the irony is, like, when I look at United, if you look at, you know, I'm up there on that stage, but I've got Jad, Taya, you know, JD, Crocker, Hastings, we've got these guys around us, and each of them have strengths I don't have. So, what, by default, my insecurity... <laughs> as far as my leadership goes like you know and it was part of it's intentional part of it's just god's grace is you've built a team so it's like so one of the strengths of united is it's all these guys with different strengths and weaknesses but it's like a football team or a basketball team you know you've got a couple of powerful forwards and a couple of you know and and i could find my place in that and then i can do what i do which is just to kind of lead and read the night and just take it where i feel like god wants to take it i can do that i know i can do that yeah um but you know it just gives me all the strength in the world to do that, knowing that there's all these other people who have strengths that like slot straight into my weaknesses elsewhere. But that's that's a byproduct. Like God, that's God, I believe, taking essentially what I would consider a weakness and then allowing that to be a strength. You know, mm-hmm. because now what we've created is something that is um, unique in the in the sense of you know you've got all these this team of people you know that's bigger than any individual, and I love that. How do you? I mean, how do you keep that freshness? I mean, you are you came back and it was like new again. You know, you've been doing this 20 years. You're a professional Christian. You're doing this whether you feel like it or not because yeah. people are paying money to show up and, mm. you know, and yeah. like, how do you, how, how do you keep it fresh? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's, it didn't happen like in an instant, you know, instance, you know, and like when you say coming out through the other side, that it was a process. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, like I... I've given so much advice to people in similar seasons, <laughs> you know? So sometimes I just like smack myself in the face with my own advice, you know, like the things you'd say to people. It's like, it's like, it's like how does, you know, winter become spring, you know? Like there's, there's a, it's cold, it's cold, it's cold. And then there's like a day that's not as cold and then it's cold and then there's a warmer day and then there's maybe a really nice day. And then it's bitterly cold again. This is at least in New York. I don't know what it's like in Florida. Maybe it's a bad hot, metaphor for hot, you. But hot, hot, cool, yeah, hot, 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 yeah. hot, 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 yeah. stormy, yeah. hot, humid, hot. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, so bad metaphor for you. Yeah, <laughs> yep. But um, no, but for like in New York, for sure, like this time of year, it's like I, I can't stand New York in April. It's meant to be warm. And it's like you think it's warm and so you get super excited and it's freezing cold. That, it's the same thing for me, I, I think. Um, and it was this time of year, really, Actually, just 12 months ago, you know, I felt like, oh, hang on, I feel okay today. Like, you know, I'm, like I'm feeling positive. But, and all of a sudden, I just started getting these dreams back. That's what I was saying. These dreams that I'd forgotten about. And I remember when I put those all aside when I was younger, just to go, I'll, I'll just be faithful with what's in my hand and let God do what He wants to do in my heart. And all of a sudden, God just started reminding me of all these things, reminding me. And I'm like, oh, no, man, like, is that possible? And I used to say to myself, I can do that when I was in my 20s. Look, I can do that when I'm 40. But right now, this is what God's given us. Just keep being faithful with that and see what happens. And it's so funny because I stop and I go, my goodness, like I'm 40 this year. Like I turned 40 in September of this year. And I'm like, well, is now the time, you know? And I'm looking around and like they were audacious dreams when I was in my 20s seemed impossible unless I started pursuing them back then. But by just being kind of following this track that God's put in front of us, which has been united in that story, all of a sudden now I look around and I go, this might be possible now, like just by doing what? by playing in our youth worship band <laughs> you know um you can't make that up so that's that's part of it and then when i started when god something about dreams you know like if if you there's two things got i felt like the enemy stole my joy 
and they stole my ability to dream. And I've always been a bit of a dreamer, like a real forward, like looking at the future and getting excited mm-hmm. about stuff. And and I lost that, and that was probably the hardest thing. And um, and all of a sudden, I started thinking about the future again and thinking, like, kind of thinking of, like, getting upset about things again because I got indifferent there for a while. Or it was like, what's the point? You know, I can't fix anything. Everything's so broke, you know? Like, mm. um, it's, man, that's a vortex if you let it. So I had people around me. I had this understanding that God had given me tools that were natural to me. They weren't unnatural things I had to do, which was for me writing songs, and and um, that really helped me kind of just at least stay occupied again. And out of that, the fruit of that is what we're in right now. Um, and then the other thing was just taking my time and just understanding there's a process out. There was a process in, you know, like we live in life, you know an event can happen in an instant and throw you into a, a, a vortex, you know, but also for me, it was something that had obviously built up over a long period of time, probably mm-hmm. years, just that I hadn't seen or taken notice of that found me in this place where there was this kind of like cataclysmic moment where I looked around and went, oh my gosh, how did I get here and how on earth am I going to get out of here? Um, it was the same on the way out, but I had this, yeah, I mean, there's so much more to tell, but we ain't got time now. The, I'll write a book about it one day. <laughs> <laughs> a million word book. Yeah. The, uh, it sounded like, you know, like you almost, even being conflicted with the movie and everything, it's like this machine was like, kept you so busy, you know, and, and, and tours and albums. And it was just like, yeah. you couldn't get off the treadmill almost. There's, there's, and then you got off the treadmill. Yeah, there's that part of it, for sure. Like fell off the treadmill. <laughs> like it, it got too fast. Like I tried to pump it up to 15 and it did one of those things that you see in those YouTube videos, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> for sure um, but a lot of it again I think was self-inflicted mm. you know it was like my defense mechanism mm-hmm. um, was to just throw myself I mean who writes like, what I'm saying is I only I wrote the book 12 times over you it's know crazy. like because I didn't want to finish it right because I didn't want to deal with what that right. looked like so and I, I I know that now looking back at it at the right. time I was like it can be better it can be better like yeah. there's more in this you know um, yeah but the dreaming thing is big. Massive. I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. Like I, my, I got spread so thin in my own life a year ago that I couldn't look past the, the situation I was in all year last year. And I hit a wall too, man. And then like, you should have called me. <laughs> I know, right? We were in the, like, you're sitting there talking. I'm going, Oh my God. Like we were like on parallel paths. It was crazy. Were you sitting on the couch too? <laughs> yeah, I actually was dude. I'm, I'm dreaming again. I mean, it's that thing of like, I, and it's a weird pivot too because we've both been doing what we're doing like 20 years and it's like mm. uh, I, I don't want to do that anymore mm. I mean when we started when we both started like you Is say it 20 like, years it's 20 years for relevant too huh? 2000 so 19 yeah. uh, next month will be issue 100 yeah you know it's just like a interesting and I think I saw issue 100 coming on the horizon and it started me going well then what I mean, am I just going to be doing another hundred? Two hundred. Yeah. yeah I mean, like, yeah. what else? And like, uh, yeah. and there was all these other, and it was like, wait, no. And I'm not like stopping. I mean, there's a place for relevant, but there's a place for United and need for it. But but there's like, when we started, like it was different then. The need that we were both filling was like so different. Hundred. And now you're changed. like talking like, well, do we need another album? Because yeah. there's so much great music. But this is the thing. That's exactly it. That's exactly how I felt what I've been reminded of is like there's been a shift like what was happening culturally in the church say in um, that time around 2000 to where we're at now and and the way young people think now right and the lay of the so land different, as the world looks and, and the way people like, you know it was a big deal one of the biggest battles for us for the last 10 to 15 years I think is to get people to think just outside of the box of of um, Christian content and um, what what the church is capable of, and I right. think one of the things that you know both relevant. I love that relevance always maintained. I think um, a strong emphasis on on the beauty in the church as well as you right. know, not um, cynical. Yeah, um, but you know, like I think one of the things that Hillsong has done. You know, my, this is my dad because he's just so passionate about it. He's always just believed that the church should be a place where people can flourish in whatever their gifts are. It's not a place that tries to like control people's gifts or like it's not. And, and, and that's what Hillsong's become is this place where, you know, I mean, over the years, so many people have come through the college or have grown up in the youth ministry and, and then gone on to do amazing things um, 
in life, but from within the church. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the big, you know, you know, it's like the, the scripture, I think it's in John 17, you know, where Jesus is praying and, um, you know, he prays that, you know, I pray, he prays for us that we would be, you know, in the world, but not of the world. And I think one of the big battles for us is, is trying to kind of like, there's this divide um, that is, we lived in a time where you had to divide your life into like, this is your kind of like your sacred life. This is you going to church life. This is your worship life. This is, you know, this is me being a Christian. And then this is your, your, your other life. This, this part of it is your, your work, um, your, you know, your friends, your, your outside of church life. And, and there's kind of like a divide there. Mm-hmm. Um, and a wedge, and we would do it with bands, like, you know what I mean? Like any Christian band that want, you know, are you going to cross over? It's like this, are you going to go secular? You know, like, is it like, is, what are you, you going to do? And, um, and, you know, that's, I've always wrestled with that, you know, and I've always found myself kind of wedged between different friendship groups, and I'm grateful for that. I think God gave me friends when I was younger who um, would, would challenge me in all the right ways, but kind of keep me on the edge where I, I've got these kind of, these group of friends who, like a cool with church you know kind of or at least they are when they're with me mm-hmm. um but would, would never come and i've got all these you know friends some of the greatest relationships ever that i've you know formed in in church over years and and so you, you know you i'm sitting there like why is there this like giant divide between these two spaces and i get that 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 this that's naturally going to exist but i don't believe that's the picture you know like and um i think god wants for it like we have to be kind of like constantly just pushing those margins out like as far as we can in a way that is not um that's intentional but should also just feel very natural because it's who we are because we are able to reconcile kind of the spirit aspect and the the, the flesh aspect of who we are individually as, as christians i don't know if this is making sense i see the opportunity now because there's a whole bunch of kids. Like if I talk to like the, the kids in our youth ministry in Australia now, they just don't think, they think there's no reason why you can't be in church and just like be Billy Eilish or be like, just, right. there's, why, why can't you do both? Right. You know? Um, and so even for Brooke, you know, cause Brooke was a mainstream artist in New Zealand. Yeah. When she, uh, when I first met her, you know, um, she was 16 or 15 at the time, you know, and, um, and then she, she, Kind of really fell in love with worship, wanted to do worship, and it was like this mainstream artist coming into the worship space, which is was kind of backwards at the time because it felt like it was all these worship kids who wanted to be mainstream artists, mm-hmm. and uh, and it was really tricky for her to kind of because once she did that, um, you know, she would go and play a show somewhere, and everyone would be screaming Hosanna, and she'd get furious, and she would like. <laughs> you know, like it was really hard for her to reconcile those two things. Are you Brooke Fraser or are you Brooke Lidget Wood? You know. Mm. Um, but it's just, I don't think that's a problem anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's, so th- that's new, that means there's new opportunities. Because mm-hmm. there's all these like, these trains of thought and these these um, mindsets that just, I think those stereotypes are being broken all the time. And so you've got a generation who are willing to break stereotypes um, while the older generation, be it ours or, or um, millennials or, you know, guys even, um, whatever, I feel like just creating new stereotypes for the church, which is all you got to do is look through your Twitter feed and everyone's got all kinds of names and ideas about what's happening in the evangelical church and, Mm -hmm. you know, and blah, blah, blah. It's, and that's, if you get caught up in that, that's fine. But man, I feel like being part of the answer, like just find out what the young people are thinking and believe in them. And I think in that, to me, I found purpose I'd never dreamed I would feel because I don't, I've, I've actually never felt like I've known what God's purpose is for my life fully. And that's why I think it's been such a journey of just going, whatever's in my hand, I'll just do that. Be faithful with that. Just one step at a time. Like God never gave me a big floodlight into the future. Like he genuinely, it's like a lamp with a candle that felt like it was always flickering in and out. That's what I've felt like my journey's been. But that's, I can do that. Yeah. I, that's within my wheelhouse. Do you feel the floodlight now? Do you, um, do you have more of a vision and intentionality than you did in the past? I feel like the light was off for long enough. Yeah. You know, maybe my eyes got a little bit more accustomed to the darkness so uh-huh. I can just see a little bit further. And I'm also okay, totally okay with not knowing exactly what it looks like, hmm. but I just see opportunities. And to mm-hmm. me, it's, it's no different. The journey in getting there is going to be one that's full of all the same the same things I've, you know, I've walked through in the past. Mm-hmm. It's the same for anybody you know, out there. Like I feel like whatever God whatever you've been through, hmm. like it's preparation, you know, always for what God wants to take you through. Hmm. Um, and, and, but the stakes are higher, but so is our confidence in who God is, our, our, our trust level and, and, um, 
and and also like i think i'm okay to fail mm -hmm. you know and and to fail in a beautiful way <laughs> you know um and and by that i mean like like what have we got to lose i can't feel any worse than i did a year ago mm. you know and i just think you know as long as my, my I've, I've i genuinely i'm grateful i feel like my like my heart is in a good place and that's always been i think the big tension um and what at least what i do i don't know for you but like i genuinely feel like you know i'm doing this for the right reasons um but all i got to do is look at young people and go all right hang on what if it's as simple as just being to to them who i wish i had when i was their age mm. someone who could just help them uh, open doors and kind of just push them because i had that when i was young mm -hmm. you know when i was young i had guys like phil dooley guys like my dad guys i mean tons of others who just believed in us when we didn't and and here we are you know and i, I that's kind of true of most people i know who've who've kind of gone on and and kind of exceeded expectations in life you know like i feel like a massive overachiever you know but i feel like also i haven't scratched the surface on what i feel like god's called me to do so there's a paradox in that always um but I look at these young guys and I, I love the, the way they think different to me. It challenges me. Mm -hmm. So get behind other people. I'm not talking about just in the worship space. I'm talking about when it comes to affecting culture in a meaningful way that, that still champions the church, mm -hmm. um, that um, brings creativity um, and uses that as uh, the tip of the spear to the, the best story the world's got to, to hear or tell which we've got, I think, I believe in, in the story of Jesus. I mean, I watch anything I watch on TV or any show I watch on television, every film I watch, I just, I'm like, are all these writers Christian or am I just seeing something <laughs> in this? Because it's like, uh, you know what, man, like God's telling his story yeah. over and over, whether yeah. it's like, whether it's intentional or not, like he's going to use the arts to tell his story. And mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's where my passion is. My eyes are lined up and going, hey, like, we've got a story to tell. And we've actually, we live in a world now where there's a means to tell it, you know, um, for all the, 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 um, the problems that come with the information age when it comes to misinformation and, you know, how that affects people's well-being and mental health and all the rest of it. Um, there's such a great opportunity there when it comes to actually, you know, um, telling, telling the story we got and, um, and doing it in a really, you know, a, a almost like a just like a, a beautifully subversive way that's like harmless you know are you approaching this tour with i don't know you seem different on stage tonight <laughs> what do you mean i don't know like it's almost like you're soaking it in older age eh? just older no no it's like seriously i feel like it's like i was wondering at one point is he soaking this in is this like the end of an era and like the new era something new is around the corner I don't know. Like, I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't tell if it was just God's been doing something in your heart and like whatever. I, but I just, like, it, there was something fresh and also like there was like a self awareness or something. I don't know. It was like a celebration tonight. You ever had a moment like where you feel like, um, like you just, like a near death experience in the sense of like, holy crap, I could, might not be here right now. And you just start seeing beauty and all this stuff that was there the whole time, but you, you know, it's almost like you need that little shake up to go, oh my God. Yeah. Like, you know, and all of a sudden, even the things that like have annoy you and like upset you and frustrate you, you still see the beauty in it. And at the core of that, I, what I see is people, because it's people that piss us all off. I'm sorry. I don't know, but it's people, you know, that, will drive you nuts mm -hmm. you know and often because you but man it's where all the beauty is because mm. they're made in the image of god and so i think for me on the other side of it i'm like going man i could not be here and i'm looking at these people and i'm going like there's this is there's just beauty here I, that's 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 the feeling i had tonight that's the feeling i have basically in life is i'm just thankful that i'm for things that I maybe took for granted. Yeah. Um, and, and because I used to that, have, that came through. I would have said in the past, you know, I would never take these nights for granted, you know, like I never take these moments for granted. But it's one thing to know and say something and actually mean it. It's another thing when it gets you like inside out, like it, when you, it turns you inside out because you've been on the other side. And so when you step back in, it's like, this is not, 
you know, like I read Richard Raw's book a few, like a number of years ago when it first came out, Falling Upward. Mm-hmm. And like I read, when I say I read the book, I read the first two chapters. I got it. Like I go, oh, yep, I get them. And a good book to me, I'll put down, you know, like, because it, uh, it inspires me. But, you know, I was like, oh, I know this. I know this. Like I know all that. Um, I read it again because it was sitting in front of me one day when I was in the middle of this kind of sabbatical and picked it up. I read the same chapters and I looked at the same little things I'd underlined and whatnot and it, it literally like my head was exploding and my heart was exploding. Like it was like revelation, not because I, I didn't know it, but because it's different when you have to walk through it and you live it, you mm-hmm. know? And um, and I think that's the goal, like is that the word for us, like the Bible, it's not just something we know, it's something that becomes flesh and blood in us, you mm-hmm. know? And in that there's a process, you know, that, that involves you know, um, often, sometimes, you know, a bit of pain and a bit of, you know. So that's the way I feel about it. Like, I just, like, I'm here and I'm going, yeah. Like, it's nothing new. Like, there's no new revelation. There's no new, there's just experience and a testimony that speaks volumes multiplied of God's grace. Mm. Um, and I hope for what that looks like in the future. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, thanks for talking to us thanks for doing this it was incredible thanks love you guys That was Joel Houston. Make sure to check out Hillsong United's new album, People. It's available now. And if you can catch their national tour that's happening right now, do it. You won't forget the experience. Hey, if you like this episode of Unedited, I'd love your help spreading word about the show. Subscribing, rating, and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts helps a ton, as well as sharing it on social media. And don't forget to subscribe to Relevant Magazine. We're running a great deal right now at relevantmagazine.com slash subscribe. And if you want to check out the current cover story on Hillsong United, you can find the issue at newsstands nationwide, or you can view it at relevantmagazine.com. Hey, thanks everyone for listening. I'm Cameron Strang. I'll see you next time here on Unedited. Relevant Podcast Network.